It's odd that when I was a young man and had lots of time left on Earth, I was very impatient. Uh, now that I'm an old man uh, and time is tight, uh, I've become very patient. It isn't that my time preference has changed. It's that I've lived through now 10 five-year cycles in my life, and I've learned that five years is a reasonable expectation to make real money. Compounding is the first wonder of the investing world, particularly in speculation. What I have learned is that making money in specula speculation, in exploration, is really about answering a series of unanswered questions. Uh, and it isn't about just answering one, it's about answering three or four. If you assume that every unanswered question re requires a new field season, you have to go through three or four or more field seasons. It doesn't mean that you have to own the stock for five years. In fact, if you discover that your expectations were wrong, <laughs> that it is unlikely that you're going to get a yes answer, you must sell the stock, whether or not you are up or down on it. But my experience, and I've done some pretty serious work back testing the 10 baggers, the thousand percent gains that I've enjoyed over my, my life. The median 10 bagger has required between five and six years. And by the way, the median 10 bagger, uh, at least once uh, in the course of holding it, has fallen by 50% or more in terms of price. So in, in addition to being patient, you have to be uh, very persistent. On the beta side of the business, that requires time too. Natural resource-based businesses, commodity-based businesses are capital intensive and cyclical, and they're a trap for somebody with conventional thinking. During periods of time when commodity prices are high and cash flows are high, earnings are high, very often the company's price earnings ratios are low and we're, te we're taught to think that low PE companies are valuable companies. But if the low PE is a consequence of abnormally high commodity prices, what happens is that commodity prices self-correct, meaning that you're setting yourself up for a trap where commodity prices collapse. What you need to do as a beta chaser, uh, as an investor, in natural resources, and this is really hard to do, you need to buy commodities that are so deeply out of favor that the industry is in or close to in liquidation. If you find a commodity where the global production cost is higher than the median price received for the commodity, you have a circumstance where either that commodity price goes up or the commodity itself becomes unavailable to consumption. The turnaround, the time required for the market to work and the commodity to rise in price isn't something that happens in a quarter or a half or a year. In order to play this game, you very often need three to five years to be right. Now, a side note, there are certain circumstances where commodities sell off very, very, very dramatically other than permanent events. One example would be two and a half years ago, the COVID shutdown of the transportation industry that took the oil price from $80 a barrel to sub 20, all the way to sub zero for one weekend. That circumstance was very clear. It, it was very clear given that the oil industry was under investing in sustaining a new project investments by about a trillion dollars a year that oil production wasn't going to be maintained and that the oil price would come back sooner than would otherwise be the case. And that of course happened. We round tripped that oil price decline in two and a half years. Don't consider this to be normal. Uh, hopefully COVID and circumstances like it won't become normal. But normally the time frames required in either investing or speculating exceed the time frames that most people who are practitioners feel comfortable with. And that's just the fact of life. I think you need to juxtapose political risk with technical risk. Uh, I would much rather have a project like Kamoa Kakula in Congo, a, a tier one deposit uh, in a tier three country <laughs> than a tier three deposit in a tier one country. Very often, uh, the tier, the so-called good countries don't steal deposits because they aren't worth stealing. But what you see is that humankind everywhere is envious. The politician's job is to redistribute wealth. Uh, <laughs> and in every jurisdiction that I have ever been, extractive industry uh, assets are attractive targets. The worst experience with political risk that I ever had involved the Castle Mountain Gold Deposit in California.
where I would argue that the legislatures deprived the shareholders of about 700 million US dollars in net present value. I was until fairly recently a property owner in the People's Republic of Vancouver, where the BCC, the Vancouver City Council and the BC legislature conspired to steal 5% of the assessed value of my real estate per annum. Uh, over four years, uh, in fact, they would have taken as much money as I had invested in the property. And yet people tell me that Canada doesn't offer up political risk. Uh, that seems to be interesting to me. I would suggest to you that people's concern about political risk becomes more narrative than arithmetic. Uh, I would suggest, as I you, you may have heard me before, say that for some reason, people prefer to be stolen from by white people in English, uh, according to the rule of law, uh, rather than lose their wealth by some more traditional method. Uh, having experienced both forms of theft, uh, I don't discriminate particularly by how my wealth is stolen. I have also found, and I learned this very early in my exploration career, a mentor of mine said, you succeed in exploration by applying old ideas in new places or new ideas in old places. If you're employing old ideas in old places, you're assuming that you're smarter than everybody that's come before you, which marks you as a fool. What that means is that the probability of discovering a really world-class deposit is going to be higher in areas where fewer experienced people have looked with modern tools. So as an example, the entire Tethian metallogenic belt, some hard countries, many of them end in Stan. Uh, but if one was going to look uh, in tertiary volcanics for porphyries or epithermal gold deposits, probably the most fertile terrain in the world. Uh, those wonderful Archean and Proterozoic belts in West Africa and Northern Africa, challenging sociological climates, challenging political climates? Absolutely. Uh, but where is one more likely to find a 10 million ounce gold deposit? Probably there. Uh, if you aren't willing to accept that, uh, I, I think you probably belong in the wrong place. By the way, I've been bit by political risk too. Uh, I, a year ago, thought the Russian stocks were anomalously cheap and didn't believe that the world would be stupid enough to go to war. And I learned once again just how stupid people can be. Uh, mercifully, I invested money that I can afford to lose because it appears that I may have. If the company is something like Exxon or Chevron uh, or even Occidental, uh, while management's important, uh, you can do discounted net present value analysis. When you're in the exploration business, what you need to understand is that they're less asset businesses and more intellectual property businesses. So what you're buying is the intellectual property and it damn well better be good. I would argue that most retail investors have better access to good managers than they think because the good managers are messianic. They want to talk about their business. They don't want to talk about baseball. They don't want to talk about politics. They don't want to talk about popular culture. They want to talk about their business. Those individual investors who go to an investment conference will be astonished that they can walk up to a Clive Johnson or a Ross Beatty or a Robert Friedland, people who've built billion dollar fortunes in natural resources, ask them a question and they won't be able to shut them up. That passion is one thing that sets apart the mediocre manager from the successful entrepreneur.